Here's what God's word says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Everybody say reconciliation. reconciliation. That's a big old word, isn't it? That is in Christ God was re- re- uh, reconciling. That is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors. Everybody say ambassadors. ambassadors. Turn to the person next to you and say, man, you are an ambassador for Jesus. That's right, ambassador for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Mm, What a powerful word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you and thank you that it's going to accomplish what you set it out to do today. Speak to every one of our hearts exactly where we are. Anoint our ears and our minds and our hearts to be receptive to you. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone would shout, amen, amen. Amen. Praise God. So today I've entitled my message, Bridges. I've entitled it Bridges because I believe that God wants us to be bridges. You know, one of the the world's largest bridge is located in Dunyang, Kunshang. That's good for me to say, some Chinese folks in the house. And a grand bridge in China. I gotta say that again. Dunyang, Kunshang. Isn't that cool? Part of the Beijing, Shanghai high speed railway. The largest bridge on the planet. This bridge, which opened in 2011, spans 102 miles. Cost about $8.5 million, which I thought that's pretty inexpensive, actually. And it took four years and over 10,000 employees to build it. What's so amazing, its average height off the ground, it's 100 feet off the ground all the way across. The high-speed train that runs on this track travels at approximately 204 miles per hour, so it takes about 30 minutes to cross the whole bridge. That's pretty amazing. It's wonderful how building a bridge can connect two places really quick and also also reduce, drastically reduce the amount of time that you have to travel between the two places. And you see, I think that many people are also trying to connect, except they're trying to connect to God. They're trying to figure out how to connect from where they are to where God is. And see, when you mention heaven to people, it seems like it's a very distant, far place. And so many religions uh, make it so difficult. They give you this path. It's so labor-intensive and complicated and able to, to please God. You got to pray seven times a day. You got all these ritualistic things that you have to do to figure out how to connect with God. But I believe we serve a God that's a lot simpler than that. Come on, somebody. Because I believe there's nothing that you can do to connect yourself to God because God already did something to connect to you already. Come on, somebody. He already took the step. Can I hear an amen? Amen. God already made the move. He's not counting on you to do all these works. Listen, at the end of the day, when God's presence becomes real in your life, then you want to pray, and then you want to do the things that God that pleases the Lord. But you do it out of a relationship, right? Not just out of rules and regulations. See, I believe that God has called us believers to become the bridge. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're the bridge. Turn to the other person and say, take it to the bridge. Come on, do a little James Brown. Take it to the bridge. Come on. Some of y'all don't know that. Y'all, y'all too young for all that. I get it. It's okay. We're going to take it to the bridge. I believe God has called us to be that. See, your prayers, your witness, your love, you know, God's divine intervention can become the bridge to bring people to Christ. And see, now we know that the bridge to the Father, listen, we know that the bridge to the Father is through the Son. Can I hear an Amen. But in many cases, the bridge to the sun is through you, and it's through me as well. 
See, that bridge, that initial bridge that people need to cross over, they want, they're looking for someone, somebody that can explain it to them, right? Somebody that can show him the way. See, I remember a person that God used to be a bridge in my life. As a very young man, we, we used to love to play basketball, and it was a Baptist church behind the schoolyard that we worked at, and, and it was a Baptist preacher. His name was Steve. Now, Steve was so cool. Steve was six foot eight. Come on, somebody. So when we started playing basketball, this brother could play some hoops. He probably played a little college ball. So he took a bunch of us kids that were out there playing. And, of course, we're looking up at Steve like, whoa, this guy could, like, jump and, and, and dunk and everything, right? So, so, we, so but one thing he did, it was, this was so cool. So he let us play basketball for the first hour from, like, 7 to 8. I mean, we'd be all hot and sweaty. It's like halftime. Okay, in order for us to play the second half, we had to go sit down and listen to the word. Come on, somebody. He made us sit down and to had us sit. And we were, we were sitting there all hot and sweaty after playing for about an hour. But we just sat there and he just began to teach on the Bible, taught about Moses, and just taught about the word of God. And, and I look back today and, you know, half the stuff, I don't think I was paying attention all that much anyway. But, how, but somewhere, somewhere along the line, I think my spirit man was listening to those words. Come on, somebody. Because he was just planting seeds. And we did this every Friday for a long time. And we just loved it, especially in the winter when it got crazy cold in Chicago. We couldn't play outside. It's like below zero. We looked forward to Friday night hanging out with Steve, Pastor Steve. And he made such an impact in so many of us. Because not only was it a good speaker and a good uh, communicator, but homeboy could play basketball. Come on, somebody. I'm like, if I had a chance to pick, I'd pick him first right off the bat. Come on, somebody. I want, I want to win the game, so I got to get Steve on my team. He's anointed a god. Plus, he's six foot eight and can jump out of the gym. And that, that's a huge advantage when you're playing basketball. And see, I remember, it can, uh, probably some of you in this room can probably remember, if you look back, on some of the folks that became bridges in your life. That maybe planted seeds while you were younger. Maybe it might have been your mom. It might have been your dad. It could have been a teacher, a pastor, a friend in school. Throughout your lifetime, you came across people. How many of you guys ever walked down the, uh, on the street and you had people handing out tracts? Anybody? Anybody run, run across somebody giving out, oh, talking about Jesus and handing out tracts? I remember so many times where I came across people. Half the time you look at it and you crumble it up and throw it away. But you know what? That was God reaching out. That was God reaching out to you in all kinds of different ways through people, uh, through strangers. And I believe that there was a couple of times where I did stop and talk to somebody. And I was, I was just listening. I wasn't even paying attention that much. But I know God was ministering in those times. He was, he was constantly planting seeds in my life. And I'm sure he was planting seeds in your life as well. See, perhaps even though you weren't listening, each one of those people participated in adding, come on, to the span of the bridge. See, they, 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 were all, they were building the bridge a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, planting seeds so that eventually each prayer was drawing you closer and closer to the other side. And then one day, hallelujah, come on, somebody, one day you made it to the other side. Turn to the person next to you and say, man, I'm glad I made it to the other side. Go ahead, tell them. I'm glad I crossed over. I sure am. Having a relationship with God is an amazing thing to have. And, you know, and we know that God has done some great and mighty things. And, and now the same way God used those people to reach you, he wants to use you to reach others as well. See, God used those folks as an example, and now he wants you to also pay it back. See, let's look at God's word tonight. We're going to go through God's word and see how we can become bridges, how we can become a bridge that others can cross on and encounter this loving and caring heavenly father See, people are looking to y'all. See, they, 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 they even make fun of, listen, they may even be making fun of you. But you know why they do it? They want to see how you respond. Are you going to get in the flesh and get all, get all, you know, get all out of sorts because somebody's doing Or do you just walk like Jesus? Come on, somebody. Do you just begin to walk in the spirit and not allow people to take you out of your game? See, they're just watching you. And as long as you stay faithful, listen, I guarantee you, the moment they have a need, they're going to know who to talk to. They're going to end up coming to you, and they're going to say, man, you know, and they're going to start sharing. And you say, wow, the whole time you were kind of pushing me and, and kind of making fun of me at times, they'll do it in front of others, right? They'll be like Nicodemus. 
when they're in front of all their other friends, they're just kind of flowing, but then they come in by themselves, come on now, and say, Jesus, what I got to do to inherit the kingdom? See, that was a private conversation with someone who was in a group of folks that contradicted the Bible. There was just a few folks within that realm, right, that actually started to believe on God as well. And you see, in our narrative, we find the Apostle Paul encouraging and reminding God's people in the church of Corinth that they are now new creations, that we are now new creatures. Turn to the person next to you and say, man, he's definitely talking about you right now. He's definitely talking about you being a new creation in Christ. Some of you guys are just a creation. Come on, somebody. We're just trying to figure out what you are. Y'all got to laugh. on It's okay to laugh at my dumb jokes. I mean, you know, it's okay. No, just kidding. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, God has great and mighty things for every one of us. And, and going forward, listen, when you become a new creation, going forward, your past no longer dictates your future. Who you used to be is no longer who you are. At the end of the day, when you understand what the Bible is talking about here, when it says that old things have passed away, that means old things have died. Old things are, are dead. They no longer exist, right? And we move on and we go forward to what God has for every one of us. So that, that's why I can stand when I share my testimony. I don't have to say I'm a drug addict and I've been sober for 30-something years. I ain't no drug addict. Come on, somebody. That Carlos is dead. He didn't nail to the cross. I ain't confessing that. See, that, that keeps people bound up for their whole life. I'm an alcoholic, and I've been, I've been dry for two, 20 years. But then why do you say you're an alcoholic if you've been dry for 20 I think you're a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things become new. Don't confess something that you no longer are because that just keep you in bondage. I say, I am free. I'm a son of God. Hallelujah. I can do all things through Christ. I don't need to go back there anymore. I got too much ahead of me to look back anymore. How many know what I'm talking about? If you do, put your hands together and give the Lord a good praise. Come on. Celebrate that new creation that you are in Christ. See, God's purpose, I love this, God's purpose for them and for all of us as well is to know that today it, we're, we are in Christ. See, we're in Christ and so that we, we can make our lives, he can make our lives new because that's what Jesus does. He comes to make all things new, better than they used to be. Not just a, not just a, a, a kind of a, a, a souped up sec, a part of something that you used to be, just tweaking you a little bit. Listen, he comes for total transformation. Come on, somebody. When you come into the presence of God, he comes to transform every area of your life so that the world can see that he's still alive and he's alive in you. If he's alive in you, put your hands together one time and say, thank you, Jesus, that you live inside of me. See, but his purpose is not just for us to become new. See, part of his purpose is for us to also become a bridge so that others can cross over and they can also experience the newness of life as well. See, God healed you so you can heal others. Come on, somebody. God saved you so you can save others. God delivered you and set you free so you can go take the chains off somebody else and lead them as well. So everything God did for you, he wants you to do for somebody else. See, that's why we, under, we need to understand that we are bridges, that we should always be on the move. We should always be opening ourselves up to allow people to cross over to the other side. And see, I, found, I want to discuss three things that are found in this passage that we just read uh, that I believe is going to help you fulfill your calling. See, every single one of us is called to become a bridge. Every single, we don't have to be an evangelist to do the work of the evangelist. See, Timoth Timothy was being mentored by Paul, and Paul said, listen, Timothy, do the work of the evangelist. Listen, that means everybody needs to do that work. That means you need to love on people. How many just loving on people and sharing the love of Jesus can bring people to the Lord? Just being kind and, and being, and being, and just smile. How about a smile? Come on, somebody. Ain't nothing worse than a Christian with no smile. Always walks around grumpy. Come on, somebody. Like they've been sucking on lemons. I don't want to be a Christian like that. If somebody walks up like that all, all gloomy and, and just and there's no joy, I said, I don't want that. I don't want to serve that God. Come on, somebody. Please don't invite me to that church. 
Y'all look rough. Come on, somebody. At the end of the day, God calls us to become bridges so we can reconcile and connect other people to the Lord. We become a conduit. We grab them by one hand and we, and we connect them to the Lord with the other. The first thing I want to share, write, the, write this in your blanks uh, if you have your sheet with you right now. The first thing is this, and it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, where it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new, or the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ re reconciled us to himself. Here we go. Here's the key. And gave us the ministry. Gave us, so the, so the first thing is this, write it in, embrace the ministry. Embrace the ministry. God gave you and I the ministry of reconciliation. Of course, we know the power of the Holy Spirit draws them in, but we need to understand that the calling, the ministry, and the purpose of reaching the laws is given to every single one of us. See, Christ has made us new creations. Now he's given us the privilege and the honor to become a bridge for others to become new. See, he recon reconciled us in him and expects us to reconcile others as well. You know, I remember early in my walk, early in my Christian walk, I ordered a book <laughs> uh, from the 700 Club back then because I had just gotten saved and, uh, and, I, and I was watching the 700 Club and they, gave, they were giving this free book called The Power, what was it called? Power for Living? Yeah, it was called The Power for Living. And it had, it had a blue cover and I said, it's for free. Come on, how many, how many can afford free? Anybody? <laughs> the, the shipping was even free. So I'm like, I'm going to order that book. It says Powerful Living. I just got saved. I need some power in my life. So I got the book. Uh, Pat Robertson, thank God, or sent it to me in the mail. And, uh, and he, he wrote stuff in it for me as well. He, I think he did that in all the books. But anyway, <laughs> I got the book and I just started reading it. It had all these testimonies of all these sports people. Like, I'm a sports person. I love sports. It had these, all these people that were in sports and football players. And, you know, Reggie, Reggie was it Reggie Smith? Was that the, the green, uh, the uh, Reggie, what's his name? He died, he passed away. But all these football players and all these people were inside that book and baseball players and they, and they were all sharing about their relationship with Christ. And I went, oh my goodness, like I'm not alone. Like there's like really cool people, like great sports people that are serving God as well. And it encouraged me. But one thing that book had inside of it, it had the sinner's prayer in this one section. When, you, when I first started reading the first part, I got to the sinner's prayer, and I went, oh, wow, that's cool. So I, I read it again. I had already gotten saved, but I read it. I mean, you can't get oversaved. Come on, somebody. There's no such thing as over praying or being oversaved. So at the end of the day, I read the prayer one more time, gave my life to Jesus, amen, got saved all over again. And, and of course, so but what I did, I said, you know, this is a good book for me to keep. So I remember flying to Chicago to visit my friend and my friend Tito, who's like somebody I grew up with my whole life. And, I, and of course, when I went to visit him, he said, man, let's go down to the basement. So I was down in the basement. I began to witness. I just shared what God had done in my life. And man, I'll tell you what, he started tearing up. It was the power of the Holy Spirit, right? He began to tear up. And all of a sudden, I said, you know, Tito, you know what you need to do? Do what I did. I just prayed. It was a simple prayer. And if you pray this prayer, man, it's going to change your life. And he was like, okay, I'll pray. So, you know, I said, close your eyes. I pulled the book out. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I hadn't even memorized the prayer yet, man. Come on, I was, too, I was so green. I, I, I just pulled the book out of my back pocket and turned to it and said, just pray after me, dear Jesus. And I read the prayer, and homeboy got born again. He got born again. You know, this is, this is the power of God. This is about embracing the ministry of reconciliation, of being prepared and ready. No matter where you are, what you're doing, listen, people can get saved in their homes. I've led people to Christ in the, in the, at the car wash. Come on, they got their car wash and their soul wash at the same time. Come on, somebody. They got a two-for-one deal on that one. Can you praise the Lord? Come on, give the Lord a praise. It doesn't matter where you are. You can lead somebody to Jesus when somebody is open and ready to receive the Lord. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And you see, Jesus has given you and I the opportunity to serve him and to serve others by this. Write this down if you're really fast. Because you need to know the way, because you need to go the way, so you can show the way. Come on, somebody. Know the way, so you can go the way, so you can show the way. 
People are waiting on you to be that person, right? Amen. Praise God. The second thing is this. This is found in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, the next verse that says, that is in Christ God was, in Christ God was reconciling the world to him, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. The second thing is this, proclaim the message. We have the message that reconciles everyone to God. It is the only message that can change the heart of a man. The gospel is the most powerful message. When it becomes real, when you're, when you're able to proclaim the gospel, it will transform the hardest heart. It will tear down the highest walls. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So when you begin to proclaim the word of God, see the realization that God loves you and doesn't hold grudges, I don't know about you, that's pretty amazing. Because how many know if God held grudges, we'd all be in trouble? We all have issues, but God is such a forgiving and loving God. Our God forgives us of our sins and, and he pardons us of all our wrongdoing. And, and he, of course, he's canceled our debt on the cross and deleted the eternal consequences. He did that for every single one of us. And now the Holy Spirit wants to live in you and help you walk out your purpose. From the inside out. God didn't just save you, but he's going to fill you. Come on, somebody. So he's going to fill you and empower you because following and being obedient to God is impossible to do in the flesh. It's grievous. It's hard. It's rules and regulations. We need the Holy Spirit in us. Come on, somebody. To empower us, to enlighten us. Amen. So that we can walk this thing out because God wants to walk it out not just in you, but through you. So it begins to show on the outside. So the Holy Spirit, God doesn't leave you on your own and say, here's the, re, re, uh, the rule book. Just go ahead and follow it. God says, no, no, no. I'm going to be inside of you. And I'm going to be coaching you from the inside out. Come on, somebody. I'm going to be talking to you every day. Just continue to listen carefully. And I will guide you to where you need to go. In Romans 10, verse 13 and 14, it says this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Oh, unless someone proclaims the message. Unless someone declares the power of God. See, God has entrusted us with the most powerful message on the planet when you share the gospel, you are bringing heaven down. You're bringing heaven to the earth and bringing the anointing of the Holy Spirit and enlightening somebody's mind to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them. See, that's not something that you reveal on your own. That's something the Holy Spirit begins to move. As you declare the message, the Holy Spirit begins to convict people's hearts, begins to enlighten them to receive the seed of God's word. Amen. See, it's not only the message, it's not just the message that you proclaim. Here's the key, y'all. It's not just the message you proclaim. A lot of folks proclaim it. It's a message you live. Amen. See, the power is when you live the message. When you live the message, then when you proclaim it, there's power. When you proclaim it, God's anointing can flow through you and make a huge impact on people around you. See, living the gospel shows that the gospel is living. Oh, I got to say that. Y'all didn't hear me. Somebody was, somebody was just jumped out of their chair right there just for a moment. Living the gospel shows that the gospel is living. That it's real. That it's not just something that people talk about. It's not just something to read about in a book. Once the gospel begins to move, it's active. The Bible says the word is active. It's living. It's, it's an organism that begins to move on the inside. And it begins to challenge people's lives. See, I love the quote by Francis of Assisi who said, Preach the gospel. Use words only when necessary. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on, y'all need to, come on, we need to live it. We need to ask God to help us live this thing. So when we proclaim it, hallelujah, there's power. And the last thing is this. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. And it says this. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. 
You see, an ambassador not only represents a, a nation, but also has the authority, listen, folks, has the authority to act on its behalf. Oh, y'all, y'all, I don't think y'all understand what I just said. See, you, if you're an ambassador of Christ, not only are you representing him, but you can now step in, come on, somebody, and speak on behalf of God. Because you see, if God created you to have that power in your life, to, to declare his word, and then he flows through you, and he gives you the authority. Come on, somebody. An ambassador. Listen, if you know what an ambassador is in another country, the actual building, that the actual embassy that they're in is actually the nation they represent. In other words, the U.S. embassy, no matter where it is on the planet, is U.S. territory. So what does that mean? That means that if you're the ambassador, everywhere you put your feet. Everywhere you put your feet. Come on, see y'all, now y'all ain't getting it. Everywhere you put your feet belongs to God. Come on, somebody. Everywhere you, you, you are the ambassador. So all the territory that you stand on, wherever you move, that is holy ground. That is God's territory. You're the ambassador. You can declare God's goodness. And he shows up because you're speaking on his behalf. When you speak like God, you speak for God. Somebody got to write that down somewhere. That's, that's just one of those things. I just, whew, that got me for a second. Whoa. At the end of the day, listen, understand that we are ambassadors of Christ and you have the authority to step into places and make things happen. God didn't didn't save you only to represent his kingdom, by the way. He also empowered you to take action. How do you know? In his name. See, we talked about that Sunday. In his name, we have authority. That means when you drop his name, come on, somebody. When you start dropping his name, he start dropping devils. Come on, somebody. When you start dropping his name, he's going to start dropping sicknesses and disease. are going to start dropping. Things will start dropping off because you're dropping the name of Jesus. And he's giving you the authority so that when you speak it, come on, somebody. All hell begins to shake. All heaven begins to move. When you start declaring the name of Jesus, your words go into, into eternity, into the corridors of eternity, and things just start jumping out of the way. Things start lining up. Divine appointments start lining up. All of a sudden, God is putting you in places that you never, ever imagined. And it happens because God has given you the authority. Look what Mark 16, 17 says. And these signs, come on, there's the authority. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Oh, come on, somebody. Somebody's got to praise the Lord right there. Just put your hands together. If nobody else is going to do it, I'll just do it all by myself. I'll, I'll tell you, I need a little help in here. Some of you need to understand that God has given you the power and the authority to take it, to, to walk on the, on the kingdom of darkness and have the power. You know, it reminds me of a story of an old lady, an older, elderly lady, sorry. An elderly person who got home from church one day and she walked in on a burglar who was burglarizing her house. She just got back from church so she was on fire for the Lord. She began to pray and she said, she said, Acts 2.38, repent. Acts 2.38, repent. And all of a sudden that guy just stopped dead in his tracks. He wouldn't even move. She picked up her cell phone, called 911. And brought the police over. Police showed up. Said, what's this, good, what's this guy? He said, excuse me, sir, why did you just stop? I mean, why did you just stop? I mean, at the end of the day, all she did was quote a scripture. He said, quote a scripture? I thought she had an axe and two thirty eights. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Authority. Come on, somebody. That's authority. That's what I'm talking about right there. (laughs) See, God has given you the ministry. He's entrusted you with the message, and he's given you the power to achieve it. So when you step out on faith, listen, people are waiting for you. God has called every single one of us for such a time as this. There is no accident that you're here right now. It's not circumstance. God, you, listen, this, you think this COVID thing surprised God? 
You think he was caught off guard? Oh, my God, what am I going to do now? I guess I got to find me one of the inoculation vaccine kind of things to try to get this thing under control. No, 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 no. God was already in the future. Come on, somebody. He knew exactly what was going on. At the end of the day, how many know sin, the wages of sin is death? Somebody else's sin can hurt people. So, so when, you, when you understand what God has called us to do in this time, he wants you to influence everybody in your sphere of influence. God has placed you in a place that people listen to what you have to say. You have friendships. You got colleagues at work. You got, that, that's your mission field. See, at the end of the day, your job is not just the job. It's your mission field. It's your calling. It's what God has called you to do. You know, I remember, I remember talking to a young man. who He was just so frustrated with his job. He says, man, pastor, I, want, I need a new job so bad. Like everybody where I work, they all cuss. They all talk like sailors. They use the, the Lord's name in vain. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm trying to get me another job. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do they pay you pretty good there? He goes, yeah, they pay pretty good. I said, okay. So what if God has you there to be the light in darkness? What if God has you there to take those people that are talking the way they do and all those sinners? Come on, somebody. Jesus sat with the notorious sinners, right? And he began to minister to them. And they, and they would listen to him, not because he agreed with their lifestyle, because he accepted them where they were and he loved them. And they felt accepted even though, hallelujah, they didn't live like him. See, Jesus had a way that compassion is what led him. And people felt the compassion. And they didn't feel judged. They felt the mercy of God. They felt, they felt something from Jesus. And guess what? God wants to put that inside of you. Because the same Holy Spirit that was inside of Christ is the same Holy Spirit inside of you. Come on. See, today is the day to accept the calling and to understand that God wants to use us in a great and mighty way. See, how do we share Christ with people? I'm going to give you this at the end, of the, the end of the list here. Just write this down quickly. Because the Bible says in Luke 14, go out into the country and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. It is our responsibility to fill the house. Come on, somebody. Listen, we'll put some marketing out there. We'll put stuff on Facebook. We'll do all that. But every single one of us is called to multiply. The very first thing God told Adam and Eve is be fruitful and multiply. The very last thing Jesus said before he left the planet, he said, go ye therefore and multiply. Make disciples. When God came in and made his entrance, he said, it's time to multiply. When Jesus left and made his exit, he said, it's time to multiply. See, we're called to duplicate ourselves by planting seeds into other people. So let me give you four real practical things, and we're going to wrap this thing up. The first one is this. How do we do it? Accept the personal responsibility. Accept the personal responsibility. When you understand it's up to you, not just up to the pastors and all the leaders. No, no, no. It's up to every single one of us, and we need to accept the responsibility. The second thing is this. Build a personal relationship. Build a personal relationship. If there are people at work, you don't have to come at them hard, right? You know, I mean, if, if, it's, it's, it's not a, a conflict. We used to call that uh, a confrontational evangelism. See, confrontational evangelism is when you're on the street and you walk up to somebody and say, hey, man, if you die right now, you're going to go to heaven or where are you going to go? That's confrontational. You don't have to tell the person in the cube next to you that. Come on, because you see him every day. <laughs> You can love on them. You can bring them coffee once in a while. You can be a blessing to them and begin to win them by building a personal relationship. Number three is this. Share your personal story. Share your personal story. Share what God has done for you. That is, that's totally irrevocable. It's, I mean, at the end of the day, nobody can, nobody can tell me. Come on. It's like the blind guy who says, man, listen, I don't know what happened. I know one thing for sure. I was blind, and then when I woke up, I opened my eyes, Jesus was standing right there. That's all I know. I was blind, but now I see. See, nobody can argue with the results in your life, especially when you're giving God the glory. And the last thing is this, number four, give a personal invitation. Give a personal invitation. Just invite people to come. You'll be surprised how many folks will show up if you just invite them. 
And if you invite them enough times, they'll come just to shut you up. Come on, somebody. I've had people come to church because I invite them like a hundred times. Every time I went to the cleaners, hey, dude, you're going to come. You told me you're going to come. Well, I expect to see you one of these days. The bank teller. Come on, I see you every, every time I go to the bank. Come on, I want to invite you to church. We invited Anna and Terrence, and they came. They came to church. A simple invitation is the most powerful thing you could do. Statistics say that 85% of people will actually show up if you just invite them. Especially when you're walking it, right? Especially when they feel the sweetness of your spirit. They feel the Holy Spirit in your life. Just invite them. I believe God's going to do something in our lives. That if you're gonna, we're going to be part of this hope movement. That hope movement is not just something the pastor dreamed up. Thought it would be a good idea to get an RV and wrap it with some stuff on it. Nice colors. Put the hope movement across it. That is so cool, bro. That is amazing. Like we're going to have this cool RV all wrapped up. Listen, that RV doesn't leave the parking lot. Don't do nothing. nothing. Come on, somebody. That RV just stands there. I got nobody else to drive it, nobody to cook when we go some places, people to give out tracts, people to witness to others. See, we started the hope movement without the RV already because the hope movement is about bringing hope to people. And see, somewhere along the line, we got to start taking our eyes off ourselves and start putting it on what God wants you to do. Find the people that God has called you to. You are called to a people group. There's a certain group of people that when you talk to them, something inside of you jumps up and down. There's a passion that gets stirred up when you talk to a certain group of people. That's your calling. You're called to those people. We're called to make a difference in our city. Come on, somebody. Richmond needs Jesus. Chesterfield needs Jesus. Henrico needs Jesus. Powhatan needs Jesus. Petersburg needs Jesus. Hopewell, Chester, come on somebody, needs Jesus. This whole area needs Jesus, but they need somebody. You need, you need to be like, like Isaiah who said, listen, here I am. Here I am. Send me, Lord. Send me. Are we going to are we going to volunteer? Are we going to step in and become a dream team member in this church and start getting connected? Let me just tell you this. I will warn you in advance. If you become part of the, the hope movement, you will be addicted to it. Because when you start seeing people transform, when you start praying for people on the street and you see tears coming out of their eyes and they're not tears because they're sad, they're tears of joy because God visited them that day. They've been praying in the dark. They've been hurting. They've been, some of them are sleeping in alleyways and all of a sudden they didn't have to come to church. The church came to them. Come on, somebody. That's what we're believing for souls and we're believing for people. And listen, I know it's uncomfortable. It ain't going to be comfortable, but I guarantee you it'll be fruitful. It'll be fruitful. The disciples came back in Luke chapter 5. They said, man, Jesus, you sent us, us out two by two. And man, we started laying hands on the sick and, and they started recovering. And, and all these signs and wonders started happening. Jesus, this was amazing. And Jesus says, man, you're right, dude. I could tell it was happening. I could tell because I saw the devil fall like lightning from the sky and hit the ground. Come on, somebody. He said, I saw it in the spirit realm. Y'all were taking the devil down hard. I could tell. And of course, it's okay to be glad because of what you're doing. But listen, he said something else. He said, but be glad. Be more glad because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He said, listen, that should be enough to inspire you. That should be enough to motivate you. If you've tasted of God's goodness, you can't help but want to share it. Come on. It's like eating ice cream. Come on, if it tastes good, you want to share it with somebody. Taste and see that the Lord is good.